song of ice and fire in Oklahoma, a multi-day ice storm wreaking havoc on power lines, thousands of residents in the dark, a disaster declaration for much of the state. Just one week from Election Day and the campaign trail is heating up. The candidates and their surrogates crisscrossing the country today, fanning across some crucial battleground states. Meanwhile, the new Supreme Court set to make a major decision on voting in one of those states. As droves of Americans take to the polls for early voting, more than 66 million ballots already cast as deadlines for mail-in voting approach. COVID cases on the rise in battleground states, the alarming increase in death rates across the country, and the state being slammed by Dr. Deborah Burks for its lack of Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. So much about 2020 is unprecedented. The election is no different. Historic early voting and enthusiasm as we are just one week away from this critically important election. President Trump is in three states today, including rallying the faithful in Michigan this afternoon. Meanwhile, Joe Biden made his closing argument in the state of Georgia, hoping to expand the map and his potential path to the presidency by flipping that red state blue. It all comes as a record number of Americans are casting their votes early, making sure that their voices are heard as the country continues to grapple with this ongoing pandemic. Mayor Bruce leads us off on the campaign trail in Georgia. And I'm proud to be an American. Down in the polls, President Trump today sprinting through three states as Joe Biden traveled to Georgia, a state no Democrat has won since Bill Clinton in 1992. Biden finishing out his campaign with a message of unity and hope. Something's happening here in Georgia and across America. People of different races, backgrounds, Democrats, Republicans, independents, they're coming together to transcend the old divides and show what's possible. Biden's presence here today a sign that he's feeling confident, focusing on states Trump won as he tries to expand the electoral map. He's even hitting Iowa this week, while also touching down in traditional battlegrounds like Florida, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Trump today alone in Nebraska, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Now I've got to say, I'm working my ass off here. This is... The president expected to hit nearly a dozen states this week and planning 11 rallies in just the last 48 hours before Election Day. Polls show he's struggling with critical suburban women voters. For weeks, he's been trying to win them over. Suburban women, will you please like me? Remember? Please. Please. Today in Lansing, Michigan, he tried this appeal. And you know what else? I'm also getting your husbands. They want to get back to work, right? They want to get back to work. We're getting your husbands back to work, and everybody wants it. Trump has struggled to come up with a coherent closing message. His stump speech, a litany of grievances and mistruths. One constant, his insistence the country is turning a corner on the pandemic, even as cases spike. But here's the story. It's COVID, COVID, COVID. You can't watch anything else. They're doing heavy COVID because they want to scare people. It's a line he's been repeating at every rally, as his predecessor gleefully pointed out in Orlando today. And what, what's his closing argument? that people are too focused on COVID. He said this at one of his rallies. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. Trump was watching, tweeting at Obama in real time. I saw Obama this morning. He had a couple of cars there hunking their horn. <laughs> Today, First Lady Melania Trump highlighting her own experience with COVID in her first and only campaign appearance. Like many of you, I have experienced the first-hand effects of COVID-19. This administration chooses to keep moving forward during this pandemic, not backward. The First Lady delivering a fiery political speech there. Mary Bruce joins us now from Georgia. And Mary, what was the reception there by voters to Biden making this visit? Does his campaign think that it has a realistic shot at expanding the map beyond the core battleground states? Yeah, they certainly do, and I think it's why you are seeing him, even in these last critical days, spending time in states like Georgia and even in Iowa later this week. States that Trump won handily in 2016. The Biden team, even though they are very hesitant to say it out loud, they are feeling confident. Otherwise, they simply wouldn't be here. We did speak with some voters here, you know, obviously Biden supporters here at this event, but they are confident, optimistic that this time around they may be able to turn this state blue. 
blue. And we also saw President Obama making a push for Biden in the key state of Florida, the First Lady in Pennsylvania. It seems like it's all hands on deck at, for both campaigns at this time. Look, they're pulling out all the stops. This is the final scramble. The president is spending a lot of time in Pennsylvania today. Of course, we saw the first lady there in her first and only campaign stop of this cycle. And President Obama, that was his second trip to Florida in just the last three days. He's trying to get out the vote for Biden in that critical I-4 corridor that we always talk about so much, where one in four Florida voters live. It is a tight race in Florida. It is must win for both, both campaigns, and it is why you are going to see both President Trump and Joe Biden campaigning there on the ground later this week, Lindsay. Final stretch, Mary Bruce, thanks so much. And now to the millions of Americans already casting their votes well in advance of Election Day. But depending on where you live, there's a patchwork of rules about when ballots must be received in order to count. And that could impact the final vote in some key battleground states. ABC's chief White House correspondent Jonathan Carl has those details. If you're going to vote by mail, it's time to get your ballot in the mailbox right now. Please, if you haven't returned it, do it this week. Now's the time. Driven in part by concerns over the pandemic, a record high 90 million voters have requested mail-in ballots nationwide. But so far, only about half have returned them. In all 50 states, those mail-in votes must be sent by Election Day. But in 28 states, they must also arrive by the time polls close. Late yesterday, the Supreme Court rejected an effort to extend the deadline in Wisconsin that would have allowed another six days for those ballots to arrive in the mail and still be counted. In 22 states, ballots are counted if they arrive in the days after the election, as long as they are postmarked by Election Day. There is nothing new about voting by mail, but President Trump continues to attempt to sow doubt about it, tweeting without evidence, Big problems and discrepancies with mail-in ballots. Must have final total on November 3rd. Twitter put a warning on that message, saying it is disputed and might be misleading. And today, another misleading statement by the president. It would be very, very proper and very nice if a winner were declared on November 3rd instead of counting ballots for two weeks, which is totally inappropriate, and I don't believe that that's by our laws. I don't believe that. So we'll see what happens. Again, in 22 states, ballots are counted even if they arrive days after the election, as long as they're postmarked on time. Another factor to watch, when the votes are actually counted. It may take a while. 34 states will not even begin to count those millions of mailed-in votes until Election Day. One of those is Texas, where polls show Biden and Trump in a dead heat. Both candidates are courting Latinos, the largest non-white voting bloc in the country. Renato Ramirez, a rancher born and raised in Texas, told our John Quiones he voted early for the president. Why Trump? The economy? Bottom line. But in poll after poll, Joe Biden has maintained a big lead among Latino voters. Seema Hernandez, the first in her family born in the U.S., wants to make sure they go to the polls. Now, there's too much at stake. There's too much at stake with this kind of president in office, with his dangerous rhetoric and his dangerous policies. Both political parties agree there is a lot at stake, and Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, with just seven days to go, we've heard some state officials say that it's too late to put a ballot in the mail. So what other options do voters have to make sure that they get their ballot sent in, in time and that their votes get counted? Lindsay, in virtually every state, you can bring that mail-in or absentee ballot in person, either at designated drop boxes or right to the county clerk's office. So if you want to be absolutely sure that it gets there, it doesn't get lost in the mail, and gets there on time, you can bring that mail-in ballot directly yourself. And John, also, let's just reiterate that the president's claim that we have to know the final vote on Election Day is just not accurate. So what should Americans expect on Election Night this year? Well, uh, you know, look, Pennsylvania, as you know, is, is such an incredibly important state. You could be critical to determining who is going to win. If we're waiting for Pennsylvania, we could be waiting for days. Uh, Pennsylvania doesn't even begin counting those mail-in votes until Election Day. They've got to go and compare signatures, go through a whole process. It could take some time. Uh, if it's a, a one-sided race one way or the other, you may have a very clear indication who is going to win election night, uh, but it looks 
looks less likely that we will have a declared winner on election night. I just have to wait and see. Jonathan Carl, thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. And now to tonight's Ballot Watch. After President Trump's campaign stop in Michigan today, we are joined now by Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Thanks so much for joining us, especially during this busy time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So first, give us a sense on where your state stands on early and absentee voting and any trends that you're seeing on turnout. For example, Democrats nationally are saying that younger voters are really coming out. Have you seen that or any increase in minority participation in areas like Detroit that saw a drop four years ago from prior elections? Yes, I mean, number one, we've just seen voter enthusiasm and, and engagement off the charts. More people are on track to vote than ever before in our state, and already more people have voted early than ever before. 2.2 million citizens have returned their absentee ballots one week prior to the polls close, and another 1.3 million have requested ballots and have yet to be returned. So we're uh, really enthused by the number of people who are engaged this year all across the state, and we're certainly seeing those numbers among young our younger voters as well. In fact, a significant majority of the newer registered voters are between the ages of 18 and 20, which is also just a great thing to see for the future of our democracy. Now, in Michigan, all ballots have to be turned in by Election Day in order to be counted. Given the delays reported in the Postal Service, would you say that, in your estimation, it's too late to trust putting a ballot in the mail at this point? If so, what's your advice to voters still holding their absentee ballots on the best ways to return it on time? I think you just said, what is it, 1.3 million? And have not yet returned those ballots. Right, and we're telling everyone, if you've got a ballot, return it either at your local drop box, and we've installed over a 1,000 secure local drop boxes all around the state, or at your local clerk's office. Just get it in by 8 p.m. on Election Day. Uh, and we're seeing people respond to that, uh, not just in Michigan, but all across the country. It's now important to return your ballots in person. Don't rely on the ma mail, regardless of what state you're in. Get your ballots in by your state's deadline. And for those who do plan to vote actually in person, are you confident that your state is prepared to run polling places smoothly on Election Day despite the pandemic? And also, what kinds of processes have you put into place to make sure that everyone who wants to vote in person will be able to do so? Yes, yeah, certainly. We're ready for Election Day voting as well. And we've been preparing for that even in the midst of this pandemic since COVID-19 came to Michigan back in March. This, importantly, will be our fourth election in Michigan this year. And we have it set up so that if voters choose to vote in person, they can be assured they'll be met with poll workers with masks and gloves and sneeze guards and hand sanitizer. All social distancing protocols will be followed as well. We've recruited over 30,000 new election workers to be ready to go, including a standby reserve group of 1,000 to ensure our precincts are fully staffed. Uh, and by getting so many people, in fact, we estimate two thirds of our voters will be voting prior to Election Day. That means for the one third remaining to vote on Election Day, they can anticipate smooth sailing, no lines, no crowds, uh, and a great experience at the polls as well. And now the president has called for his supporters to serve as poll watchers on Election Day. What's being done to keep voters safe from any potential voter intimidation, especially in the wake of the plot against Governor Whitmer and your state's history with militias? Well, as the state's chief election officer, I do take very seriously my responsibility and authority to protect not just the health and safety of our voters at the polls, but the security as well. Uh, and so we've you know, issued several uh, directives to our clerks and our poll workers to know what to do. If you see voter intimidation, we've been working with law enforcement to also protect the sanctity of the polling place. And we'll also have people throughout the state on the ground ready to respond if things occur, because we want to keep those precincts as calm, as sacred as possible. The president falsely tweeted last night that we must have a final vote total on election night. You quickly responded back on Twitter. Nope, wrong again. Candidates don't get to decide when results are announced. Election administrators do. So how much of the vote do you expect to get counted by election night? And any concern at all that not having a final vote for several days could potentially lead to legal challenges if the race is closely contested? Well, my priority is making sure that every valid ballot counts. We anticipate probably over 3 million ballots will have been submitted early. Uh, we will begin counting them on Election Day, and it is going to take time to work through all of that. And that's what we should want. We should want uh, secure protocols in place, methodical uh, counting to ensure accurate results. And I'm confident that uh, both will maintain transparency from the moment the polls close to the moment we have that full tabulation to update the public about what's actually happening. 
so that they can be confident in the results. One more question just want to sneak in here. Of course, we've been interviewing several secretaries of state, and, and I've been just asking, what keeps you up at night, if anything, as it applies to this election? Well, certainly the biggest variable is misinformation. And we've done an incredible amount of investment in educating our voters to not just know their rights and their options to vote this year, but to be prepared to counter disinformation or misinformation if it hits their communities. We've had robocalls, we have had false text messages, and various other things designed to confuse voters about their rights. And the really gratifying thing is that voters are responding by, re by reporting that misinformation to myself and the Attorney General so that we can investigate and hold accountable those who would seek to sow seeds of doubt falsely amongst our voters about their rights. It certainly does keep me up at night because we want to make sure we're always out in front on top of it and responding to it as quickly as possible so that no voter is disenfranchised based on misinformation or disinformation. And we see your necklace there, V-O-T-E. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And of course, ABC News is your home for live coverage on election night with our powerhouse political team. Our coverage starts at 7 p.m. Eastern on November 3rd, one week from tonight. We turn now to the unrest in Philadelphia over a deadly shooting of a black man allegedly armed with a knife. The man's family says that he was having a mental health crisis and that they called for an ambulance, not the police. Dozens have subsequently been arrested in the protests and at least 30 officers have been injured. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest. Tonight, turmoil in Philadelphia, anger spilling into the streets over the death of Walter Wallace Jr., allegedly armed with a knife, shot by police. Crowds clashing with authorities. 30 officers injured. This video shows a pickup plowing into one. That officer hospitalized now in stable condition. Police say they responded to a call Monday. Wallace's family says they told the officers he was having a manic episode and that he was bipolar. This video shows two officers on the scene. They repeatedly ask Wallace to put the knife down. Wallace continues moving toward the officers. They fire roughly 14 shots. Why was the fact that the first thing them officers did was pull their weapon on that man? The Philadelphia Police Commissioner there shortly after the shooting. I'm here to listen. I don't have answers for what happened today. And for more on this, let's bring in Eva Pilgrim. Eva, today we heard from an attorney for Walter Wallace's grieving family who said that they had actually called for an ambulance, not the police. What else is the family saying about this shooting? Oh, well, the family's attorney today saying basically, you know, they were expecting help in this crisis situation when they made that call and that they don't want this, what happened to them, to happen to any other family. And they are calling for change tonight, Lindsay. And Eva, some of the neighborhoods where the worst unrest occurred took place in neighborhoods with strained community police relations. You worked in Philadelphia for several years. What are you seeing on the ground there tonight? Well, Lindsay, this is a community that has long had a history of a strained relationship with police. There's a infamous situation that happened back in the 80s where Philadelphia police actually dropped in city in bombs basically onto a home in that same neighborhood where all of this went down. And that is very much still in the memory and in the minds of a lot of the people that live in this neighborhood. It's something that they still talk about today. And that distrust of police uh, is something that continues continues uh, to grow over time and the police commissioner today said you know in this current climate they have to figure out a way to train these officers to better deal with these situations Lindsay right to try to de-escalate them okay Eva Pilgrim our thanks to you and now to the surging pandemic in this country, a record high of average new infections a day, more than 73,000, with Wisconsin having its highest daily increase yet. And Dr. Burke sounding the alarm about another state that she says has the least use of masks. ABC's Alex Perez brings us the latest. Tonight, the coronavirus is spreading like wildfire. The country averaging more than 73,000 cases a day, the highest during any seven-day stretch in the pandemic. It is frustrating to me to see all these people that are really suffering through this disease 
and can't see their families. Wisconsin marking its worst day, a record 5,200 cases and 64 deaths. Deaths from COVID are now climbing in 29 states. In El Paso, doctors are also worried about losing patients without COVID because hospitals are overwhelmed. This is a disaster. People are going to start dying. As a matter of fact, they started dying already, not because they have the COVID, but because the COVID has impaired the ability to deliver care. In Philadelphia, cases soaring to levels not seen since May. City officials urging residents to cancel holiday plans. Family gatherings right now are simply very dangerous. The highest the COVID case rate per capita, North Dakota. Dr. Deborah Burks and Bismarck are calling out residents. This is the least use of masks that we have seen in retail establishments of any place we have been. Nearly 43,000 Americans are now hospitalized with the virus, like 34-year-old Amanda Best at this field hospital in Wisconsin. She has asthma and has been fighting COVID for a month. It definitely impacts everyone differently. I, did, I wouldn't have predicted to be in this situation. 18-year-old Michael Lang's family says he had no pre-existing conditions before the college freshman came home with symptoms in September. Weeks later, going into cardiac arrest and dying. To hug your kid, tell your kid every day how much you love them. And I have to say that was something I was happy I did as a parent with Mike. Such an important reminder for us all. And we now bring in Alex Perez. Alex, tell us about the new research about when those COVID antibodies and with it immunity may start to fade. Well, Lindsay, you know, so many people are wanting to learn details about this, and we have this new study out of Britain that finds antibodies, it appears, begin to decline after about three months. It still, however, remains unclear what exactly that means for immunity or for reinfection. This field hospital behind me here, they stand ready to take in some 500 patients, more than 500 if necessary. Lindsay? All right, Alex Perez, thanks so much for your reporting. And turning now to the new images of the devastating wildfires in Southern California, more than 90,000 people have been forced to evacuate powerful Santa Ana winds fueling two massive fires threatening entire neighborhoods. And firefighters have certainly had their hands full desperately trying to save homes, at least 10 damaged, some completely destroyed. The utility company is now investigating if its equipment is responsible for causing one of those fires. ABC's Kaylee Hartung is there with the latest. Tonight, those Santa Ana winds fueling dual Southern California fires that have forced 90,000 to flee. This car packed up and ready to go. Ready to go. A security camera capturing the Blue Ridge fire closing in on Indy car driver Graham Rahal's home Monday. <laughs> Nearby firefighters rushing to save what they could of the Bailey family's home. This is what it looks like inside tonight. It's hard to see it gone because of all the work that we've put into this house. And we're learning five firefighters were injured battling the Silverado fire, including two now in critical condition. It's tough for any firefighter, certainly any fire chief, to, to feel this helpless when you've got uh, part of our fire family, um, again, fighting for their lives. And Lindsay, these powerful winds that have been driving these flames, they are finally starting to die down. That's the good news. The bad news, though, temperatures here are rising 10 to 15 degrees above normal. So in these dry conditions, that fire threat remains. Lindsay. Our thanks to Kaylee for that. And turning now to the emergency in the Gulf Coast, Louisiana and now Alabama making it official, declaring states of emergency as Zeta regains strength. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is at it yet again. What's the latest, Rob? Can you believe it? We're here again, uh, Lindsay, on yet another storm, another potential hurricane to threaten the state of Louisiana. Right now, about just over 400 miles uh, south of us and heading to this spot. So we've got hurricane warnings that are posted for New Orleans all the way uh, to the Alabama border and then tropical storm watches that have now just been posted for Atlanta Metro. So there's a fast moving storm that's going to bring some of these damaging winds well inland. We expect it to be around a category one storm tomorrow at this time, making landfall across southeast 
uh, Louisiana, then Mississippi and Alabama, a storm surge of two to eight feet. We will see a significant rain with this, but not flooding rain because it's moving so quickly. We will see tornadoes on the east side of this thing as it rockets up across the North Georgia mountains, across the Smokies, the Appalachians, and getting across the Del Marva, and then heavy rain and wind and snow uh, coupling with the leftovers of this thing by uh, Thursday night into Friday for the Northeast. So a huge chunk of the country getting a taste of this this time of year. We do have fast moving systems, so not much in the way of flooding rain, but we will see damaging winds and a significant surge for this, the 11th named landfalling storm here in the U.S. This season continues to be a record setter 2020. 11 Lindsay. already. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. When we come back, the police chase inside a Walgreens and why another officer opened fire. Why a federal judge rejected the Justice Department's attempt to intervene in a defamation lawsuit against President Trump brought by a woman who claims he raped her in the 90s. But up next, it's been called a historic decimation. The pandemic has certainly impacted all Americans, but Latinos are bearing a heavy burden. How this may impact the election. Stay with us. stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matata. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? To figure out what's really out there. It was a spectacle. Aunt Becky on a perp walk. That's wild. These wealthy parents tried to rig the college game, but in the end, they would be the ones getting schooled. Operation Varsity Blues. 75,000 to get any test scores you would like to get. Sounds like a deal to me. So, think you know everything about this crazy story? <laughs> Don't be so sure. Their mouth just dropped open. I'm Whoopi Goldberg. This is the con. Buckle up. Wednesday night on ABC. Stop! Get on the ground! Stop! Hey. Take a look at this dramatic scene captured by a body camera being worn by a police officer inside a Walgreens in Modesto, California. The officer chased a suspect up and down the aisles before he fell to the ground. The suspect appeared to have a gun, and that's when another officer opened fire. The suspect was later arrested and treated for a minor wound. And we now turn back to the pandemic, but specifically the impact it has had on the Latino community. Latinos who are overrepresented in jobs deemed essential also are overrepresented when it comes to COVID infection and deaths. One expert has gone as far as calling it the, quote, decimation of the Hispanic community. Our Victor Akendo has more on the battle for America's largest ethnic minority. The sounds of the mariachi are unmistakable. From the gold trumpets to the strumming guitarron. But today, the music that so often marks life's joyful moments at weddings and quinceañeras is playing at this funeral mass. We are here to say farewell to the loved ones who lost the battles against COVID-19. The people here, a tight-knit community of Mexican immigrants from Chinatla, Puebla, honoring loved ones that never received a proper goodbye. When they hear our notes and our songs, our lyrics, you know, we want them to feel that they're in Mexico, that they're 
interfere with their families, you know, connect them in some kind of way. Eric Perez Cantó. Their photos, a reminder of lives cut short from a disease that has ravaged communities like this one. According to the CDC, Latinos are dying at a disproportionately high rate from COVID-19. A recent analysis of more than 114,000 COVID-related deaths between May and August found 24% were Hispanic or Latino, despite being only 18% of the U.S. population. Paula Felipe Ramos. Lucero Martinez Felipe has waited six months for this day. Her mother Paula died on April 16th, just three weeks after getting sick with COVID-19. I miss her and I needed to find certain peace in myself and I think today I was able to actually feel peace for the first time since the day of her passing. At the time, cases of the coronavirus growing exponentially in New York City, quickly becoming the epicenter of the global pandemic. The COVID-19 outbreak becoming a top issue for Latino voters. I think I always knew who I would not vote for, and it definitely won't be for the one that just stood there and watched it happen and didn't do much to help us. Dr. Peter Hotez, one of the world's leading experts on vaccines, is growing more alarmed by the data. What we're seeing really is historic decimation uh, among the Hispanic community by this virus. From the Rio Grande Valley to the big cities, a troubling pattern emerging throughout the nation. Elizabeth Romero saw COVID-19 sweep through her Long Beach community. I was like, we're strong, we're young, we're healthy. We could get through this. I never knew I was gonna take my husband away. Elizabeth was on the phone with her husband, Jose, who was in the hospital bed when he suddenly went into cardiac arrest. 45 minutes, I was on the phone. They tried 45 minutes to bring him back. And I'm like, no, not my husband, he I'll be gone. Why are Latino communities getting hit so hard by this pandemic? We are essential workers, much more likely to be essential workers. We have to be out there. In the, in the pandemic, some of them had to take public transportation. There was no choice. Also, many of us live in more crowded housing, places of higher social density. All those things have been a major issue why Latinos at higher risk. Dr. Olvin Carasquillo, a Puerto Rican native and chief of internal medicine at the University of Miami Health System, is determined to help his community. He's leading one of the clinical trials for the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine and is calling for more diverse participants. We need more minorities, both Latino, African American, to participate in these studies. We need to make sure these vaccines work on our people. He says health disparities among Latinos are compounded by one's immigration status and lack of health care coverage. You see these young persons uh, with immigration issues that really didn't want to come. They worked down in the fields in Homestead. They came in really sick with extremely low oxygenation status. And you could tell, you saw the fear in their eyes. Homestead, Florida, just 40 miles south of Miami's famous beaches and nightlife, where these farm workers toil in extreme heat, harvesting food. We have to kind of start changing our mentality and thinking, you know, the farm workers that feed us, maybe they need to come first. They have to be the first in line to get the resources and the help that they need. And with the temperatures cooling, more families are expected to hunker down together indoors. The nation's top infectious disease specialist, Dr. Anthony Fauci, warning that the number of deaths could grow to 400,000 if precautions aren't taken this fall and winter. One of the biggest holidays for Latinos, Christmas Eve, Noche Buena. You're saying it should look different this year. Look, uh, my brother bought a house. We're all planning this big lechon and all this stuff, and now we don't know. Uh, how do you have Noche Buena without a lot of people? If you ask me right now, that's what I would recommend. Small event, especially if I had older people in my family, which we all do. You know, there's no way I would want my mom to be in a social setting with 30 people. That's just not what I would want, as hard as it is for us. And you can see more of Victor's report tonight, along with other stories highlighting the issues facing the Latino community as we head into Election Day right after this show as part of an hour-long ABC News Live special, America's Future, The Power of the Latino Vote, anchored by my friends Tom Yamas, Cecilia Vega, and John Quinones. Still ahead here on Prime, prosecutors accused this cult leader of branding his victims, sexually exploiting and treating them as slaves. Today he learned how much jail time he'll serve. The new Supreme Court Justice 
Amy Coney Barrett sworn in and the big cases coming up. And we take a closer look at those early voting numbers and the rising influence of the Latino vote. But first, our tweet of the day, love is in the air. Congratulations to Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. The time has finally come. We have to win. This is the most important election in the history of our country. I will draw on the best of us, not the worst. I will be an American president. Who will be your next president? I am your president of law and order. I won't fan the flames of hate. Election night, ABC. We will make America great again. This is a battle we will win and we'll do it together. ABC Election Night Live and on Apple News. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Who is a sophisticated, sadistic killer. He murdered more people than the Zodiac Killer. What turned him on was terror. How did one woman's obsession... Michelle McNamara was a true crime blogger, a mom during the day writing about true crime at night. Help bring down... He was right in their face. Move and I'll kill you. Sometimes he would call them. A serial killer. We just hear go. The stunning 2020 event, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Welcome back, everyone. Tonight, we take a look at the growing power of the Latino vote in America in this election and heading into the future by the numbers. A record 32 million Hispanic Americans are eligible to vote in 2020, according to Pew Research projections. That's 13 percent of all eligible U.S. voters. And for the first time in American history, it exceeds the number of black eligible voters in a presidential election. With still a week to go, 4.3 million Latinos have already voted in this election, and these votes make up 7.5 four percent of the total early vote according to target smarted democratic data firm the latino early vote has already surpassed the 2.1 million latinos who voted early in 2016 and in the key battleground state of florida 915,662 latinos have already voted that's more than 15 percent of the state's total early vote and in closely watched texas 1.2 million latinos have already cast ballots making up 17 percent of that state's early vote and it's worth noting that while Latino voters as a whole tend to be more Democratic than Republican, this diverse demographic does not vote as a single block. In 2016, one in five Latino voters backed Trump. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. We continue to track the Senate races that could change the balance of power in Washington. Tonight, our conversation with Democratic challenger Mike Espy, could he actually win the Mississippi seat? And if you're a baseball card collector, listen up. Your cards could actually be worth more because of the pandemic. But first, we'll look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch.
What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, it's me too. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you very much. Thank you. President Joe Biden spending an entire day in Georgia, a state no Democrat has won in nearly 30 years. I know we can unite and heal this nation. The state is one of six battlegrounds Biden is expected to campaign in this week in an effort to flip votes President Trump won in 2016. President Trump also hitting the campaign trail hard, planning to stump in nearly a dozen states this week. We're going to have a great red wave people that want to go out and vote, vote. With 11 rallies scheduled in the final 48 hours before Election Day, Biden and his surrogates continue to hammer President Trump on his pandemic response. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. Trump defending himself before heading to his first campaign stop of the day. One of the things we've done a really good job on is COVID. We would have millions of people dead. Justice Amy Coney Barrett sworn in today at a private judicial oath ceremony and ready to take to the bench of the Supreme Court. Her offices are the former chambers of late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. A federal judge has ruled that the Justice Department cannot substitute for President Trump in a defamation lawsuit brought by former advice columnist E. Jean Carroll. A law protecting federal employees does not apply to President Trump because his denials of a rape allegation are outside the scope of his employment. Former gossip columnist E. Jean Carroll claims the president assaulted her in a department store in New York City 20 years ago. She sued the president for libel after he told reporters that Carroll made up up the story. The Nexium cult leader was sentenced to 120 years in prison. Keith Ranieri was convicted last year of turning some of his female followers into sex slaves and branding them with his initials. When justice catches up with you, as it did today, uh, it, it is severe. Uh, Keith Ranieri will not be able to uh, to victimize people anymore uh, after today's sentence, and we're, we're very grateful for that. Throughout it all, even through today, Ranieri acknowledges that he is an interesting and controversial and unconventional person, but in a recently released podcast from behind bars, he also claimed he's something else, hey, innocent. Up. Women have been treated terribly in this country and then in the world, but in particular in this country, by people of power, by people like me. But that doesn't mean that I did those things. And it certainly doesn't mean that I'm guilty of these charges. They're the traditional signs of fall. Baked pies, crisp leaves, fried chicken. The KFC Yule Log is back. Fill your nostrils with the smells of the Colonel's 11 herbs and spices. A burn time for up to three hours. The reviews on Walmart's website overwhelmingly positive. As one consumer puts it, one log will have you too hungry to want to light another. While it may smell delicious, mind the warning on the back, not actually fried chicken. 
Turning now to the race for control of the U.S. Senate as Democrats fight to win back the chamber, there's a race that hasn't gotten as much national attention. Mississippi has not elected a black senator since Reconstruction. We're talking about roughly a century and a half ago. Mike Espy already made history once, becoming the state's first black congressman since Reconstruction when he won election in 1986. Now he's trying to break barriers again, this time in the U.S. Senate, and he joins us now. Thank you so much for your time. Hello, good morning, thank you so much. Good evening to you. So last month you tweeted, and I'd like to quote here, Democratic Party leaders have ignored our race for the U.S. Senate in Mississippi. They don't think a black man in Mississippi can win, and they continue to count out the South and black voters. Now, since the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, donations have poured in with now just one week to go until Election Day. Has the Democratic Party made the investment that you think it'll take to win Mississippi? Lindsay, sometimes the, the uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease, and so we had to say something because at that time, you know, it was it was real, and it was even almost urgent. So yes, I can say now that our plaintive cries uh, have been answered. Uh, we've had substantial contributions and interest from the DSCC and the DNC. I speak with their donors uh, quite a bit, almost every day. So they've now come into Mississippi. They've allowed us, of course, to run our own campaign with our own message, but they've been buttress in it with support. They've helped us with polling, with, uh, with uh, organizing in the field, and they've enabled us to build what I believe is the largest, highest, deepest voter coalition in Mississippi's history. We've been building it for a year and a half. They've come in in the last couple of months, and I think it's going to reveal itself to be something marvelous. So given that, would you still say that it's going to be difficult for you to win statewide when President Trump is expected to win Mississippi by wide margins, especially when you were not able to win the seat in a special election back in 2018 when Trump was not on the ballot? Well, Joe Biden's going to do very, very well here. I'm not saying to you, honestly, he'll win. He's going to do much, much better than Hillary Clinton did in 2016. Also, we've noticed in our internal polling that President Trump has lost a lot of steam in Mississippi. That's primarily because of his mismanagement of the virus. So everyone knows he lied to us, and because he lied, we have now more than 3,200 Mississippians who have died. Also, yes, I ran before 19 months ago against the same awful senator, Senator Hyde Smith, who wants to take us back to, a, to another day. But even though we were the last Senate race in the nation, we only had about six months to run. We got in there, we ran hard, and we got almost 47% of the vote. So I took that really as a harbinger of things to come. I really believe that I had to run then in order to win now. We learned a lot of lessons. We corrected our course. We have a new path, and I think we're going to win here in seven days. All right. Well, Mississippi is certainly one of five states that does not allow no excuse absentee voting and is widely considered one of the hardest states to vote in. The state does have the largest share of black voters per capita in the country. Do you think that black voters will be able to vote in large enough numbers to make a difference, a substantial difference in this race? We've already said it. Uh, you're right. We, uh, we have some archaic voting laws and we, we need to do better. But we do have, um, we have in-person voting, early voting for certain categories. Those who are 65 of age or older, those who are disabled, and those who can prove that they won't be at home on November 3rd. So we've just been watching, and I've been very impressed with the long lines of voters, uh, many, many, many of them African-American voters who are, who are going to vote early, who are, who are fit within those, those categories. I want to play for you President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner's comments yesterday about the black community getting a lot of attention. One thing we've seen in a lot of the, 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 the black community, which is mostly Democrat, is that uh, President Trump's policies are the policies that can help people break out of the problems that they're complaining about, but he can't want them to be successful more than they want to be successful. What's your response to that, and what do you say to a white voter in Mississippi who agrees with his statement? Uh, I can say that he's wrong and they're wrong. You know, it's uh, it's an awful thing to say. Uh, Lindsay, I'm the chairman of the board of a $400 million nonprofit. I've been on that board for 25 years, and we have a mission function. We go into low-income areas in the Mid-South, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, and uh, Arkansas, and we fund first-time 
homes for, for those who've never owned a home before. We fund businesses that are viable. We build medical clinics. So what I'm saying to you is that uh, we work in these low income, low income communities. Majority of them are African American. So uh, what Jared Christian said is um, is uh, is awful. You know, I've got I've got stronger words for it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> uh, just by the virtue of fact, I've seen people wanting to lift themselves up, uh, coming into my uh, financial organization, my nonprofit, twenty five four hundred million dollars. I know they want better. They want better credit. And uh, they want an opportunity. If they get an opportunity, they're going to seize it and they're going to lift themselves. Tell Jared Kushner he's a lie, and uh, and so are the others who believe that way. And finally, you are one of five black candidates for Senate running in the South this election season, where voters have only elected one black senator since the 1860s, talking, of course, about Republican Tim Scott in South Carolina. What do you anticipate your reaction would be if none of you are able to break through with a win, especially after this year's alleged reckoning on race and social justice? Well, I don't think that's going to happen, to be honest, but you did ask the question. If that happens, we'll just have to keep on building. I ran before 19 months ago, and again, I got 47% of the vote, even though we only had six months to run. So, you know, in the South, we suffered from a legacy of disinvestment. If we had had uh, $20, 30000000 million coming into Mississippi uh, 10 years ago, we would have uh, better data. We would have a better political infrastructure. We'd have a stronger bench. So what we're doing now is um, is um, filling that vacuum. Candidates, uh, candidacies like mine and candidate campaigns like ours, we're doing the hard work. We're building the bridge that I can cross over and others behind me and so forth. So we're doing the hard work and we'll continue to do that. And uh, But I don't think that the uh, what you just said or, or I'll just um, imagine will happen. I think we're going to do very, very well in seven days. All right, it is the final stretch. Mike Espy, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. And when we come back, we are talking baseball, baseball cards, that is, the hobby that spanned generations is seeing a resurgence in recent years. We'll find out what's behind the card collecting comeback when we come back with our political director, Rick Klein, showing us his own impressive collection. Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore. These are your worlds. Wherever and whenever you want them, you'll find them all here on Disney Plus. Cross my office up the list. What if we take free time? Please stop. Yes. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. 32 million Hispanics eligible to vote in this election. The potential power of the Latino vote in America is... They would have a tidal wave impact. And now, with the most consequential election of a lifetime closing in fast, what will be their impact? Latinos, exercise your right. I get what the vote. From ABC News, powerful, astonishing, revealing, historic. America's future. The power of the Latino vote. The all-new event special breaks tonight on ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward.
Welcome back, everybody. This spring was certainly a long one for many of us, especially for sports fans. The pandemic bringing the entire sports world to a complete halt. It's also crushed many businesses, but the business of sports card collecting is on the rise once again, especially in the age of COVID. So we wanted to find out what's behind the card comeback. And, and we got some help from our own political director, Rick Klein, who took a little time to share his impressive collection, as well as his knowledge and love of the hobby. These are some of my treasures that accumulated over, over many years of collecting. You might have binders, boxes, or even an entire room. Blue Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, Babe Ruth. For many, they're relics of a bygone era. But sports card collecting is having a moment and becoming even more popular during the COVID-19 pandemic. It brought people back to collecting to try and do something that is safe, that they can do at their home, they don't have to travel for. Shops like Sports Car Junction in Pittsburgh have been busier than ever. Business has absolutely exploded. So there, there's a lot of fresh faces that we're seeing. Honestly, daily, we see new people in our store. It's certainly not a new hobby. This one's from 1887, the best player of the, of the 19th century. Card collecting exploded among the baby boomer generation in the 50s and 60s. And then again, a couple decades later, when those boomers and their children started collecting in the 80s and 90s. Companies like Topps, Panini America, and Upper Deck helped sports card trading take off. But with the dawn of the internet age, the business changed, and card collecting became less popular as stores started closing up. Enter 2020, the first time in modern history when all sports were shut down for months due to the pandemic. Many fans found their fix by rediscovering the timeless hobby. As we all found ourselves inside with, you know, maybe no sports on our TVs, what we saw was a lot of people came to Tops as a way to really feel that connection between themselves and the game, themselves and their favorite players. eBay reports that basketball cards specifically are on the rise, with a 130% increase in sales in the beginning of the pandemic from the end of 2019. Chicago! Michael Jordan cards surged just after the release of The Last Dance in April. You had a perfect storm of the Michael Jordan documentary dropping, which that was so nostalgia 90s. Um, and you had kids like, oh, man, I remember going in and trying to pull an Isaiah Thomas card or Michael Jordan, and they can go back now and see how cool these cards are. But even before COVID-19, the sports card industry had been trending up over the past few years. We were coming off one of the best years in 2019, and so it's really exciting exciting to see that momentum continue into 2020. A growing number starting to see the financial benefits that come with having a valuable card. I literally have people who you have know, spent two, three million dollars and never will actually see the cards. They buy it, they ship it off to a safety deposit box and it stays there until they're ready to sell it. In 2020 alone, two LeBron James cards and a Yanis Antito Kumpo card each sold for more than a million dollars. And a 2009 Mike Trout card sold in August for a record 3.84 million, breaking a record once held by a T206 Honus Wagner card. They're buying it for an investment purpose because they believe it's gonna go up, but they also are legitimately trophy hunting. You know, Mookie Betts. And there's more to it than just having the cards. Many of the top sellers go through a grading process with companies like PSA and Beckett to make sure their cards are in top condition with a great from one to 10 driving the value. Now, people don't need to worry about, is this real? Is it not real? Is this mint? Is this on a scale of one to 10? Is it a two? Is it a 10? Patrick Mahomes 101. Another reason for renewed interest, YouTube and online video platforms. Card buyers pool their money for something called a box break, where you can watch online as those boxes are opened, revealing the cards inside, hoping one of them is a big hit. Hyper Luca. Boom! Gigantic hit. In reality, it brought tens of thousands of people into this industry who wouldn't be here if they hadn't bought into breaks. You have fans connecting online, uh, trading with each other in forums, on social media, watching live box breaks on YouTube, you name it. Among the most enthusiastic of card collectors is our very own political director, Rick Klein. That's from the first major tops issue, Willie Mays, his rookie card, Hank Aaron. Giving us some pointers. If your collection looks like this, you know, the cards like this from the from the 90s or the 80s, you're not a millionaire. Taking us on a tour of his mini museum. 
what's great about this hobby, the people that I've met, the connections that I've made, um, knowing that this is something that I've done with my brother, with my father. It gives me a connection to a younger version of me, to a sport that I love, to a hobby that I love. A nostalgia-inducing hobby rooted in tradition, but still evolving. With today's cards featuring new designs, even including autographs and memorabilia. That's a piece of an Andy Pettit jersey. You can almost make out the K. It's your pitch. The cards capture distinct moments in time. One of the top selling cards of the year, Dr. Anthony Fauci's opening day first pitch. I think they did him a favor by getting that particular picture. We know where the ball went after that. It was not pretty. That, that, that's, a, that's pretty kind to Anthony Fauci. Not that he doesn't deserve it. So what is it that keeps us coming back to cards? There's no age limits. You can be a toddler, you can be 100. Someone who's collecting million dollar cards still has something in common with someone who might only be able to spend $10 on a card. These are some cards of people that I've met and it was able to get autographed in person like Cal Ripken. The real value is found in more than just the card itself. The persistence of baseball cards in this digital era is something special because at the end of the day, you are just talking about a piece of cardboard, um, sometimes a flashy and you know, a shiny one with, with something, something else put in it. But at the end of the day, having that thing and having it mean something, I think is pretty special. A throwback to yesteryear making a resurgence. Our thanks to Rick Klein. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, and it's a heartwarming one. This mother overjoyed as she watches her young four-year-old walk with a cane for the very first time. This little guy was diagnosed with a rare eye condition, limiting his sight. He was a bit cautious at first, but then starts to hit his stride. His biggest fan tweeting out, Mama's got you. She certainly does. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and good night. Hola, I'm Alex Perez.